a lot of the things that I would have said have been said over the last few days. So some of this is going to be summary. Some of this is going to be um, picking up some of those issues and, and making points, again, that I think, I think are important. Um, I did want to start off by saying that um, I, I'm a policy practitioner before I'm an academic and lots of other things. Um, so I'm actually looking for solutions now. I want to be able to leave this room and be able to do something, and I certainly want to do something in my lifetime. So um, waiting for the end of sort of late capitalism or something is not going to be terribly helpful to me. I'd like to <laughs> see something before then. Um, I have had the experience over the last 20 years of being practically involved in um, the establishment of policy and regulatory institutions um, in a transitional society, in a, um, a, a previously authoritarian and um, now emergent democratic society. And I've also seen over the 20 years um, the sort of depressing outcomes of structural um, inequality um, and the persistence of that despite political reform within the country. So after the last 20 years in South Africa, we are confronted still by um, structural unemployment, structural inequality, um, the political outcome of a, you know, a very much praised miracle democratic outcome. In fact, you know, in, in, perhaps in practical terms, an elite compromise, a compromise, a continuing com compromise between mining capital and um, local power elites um, that has perpetuated a lot of these um, inequalities um, and continues to, to do so. And then, of course, just in terms of institutional endowments and institutional endeavors, um, seeing the um, failure of um, democratic institutions that we've tried to set up using um, Western um, and, you know, Western liberal, and I see this not as a negative thing, <laughs> I see this part of a sort of process of modernity that I embrace um, from, a, from a, a rights point of view, but setting up um, multi-party um, institutions um, for governance that um, are based on notions of um, this change and reform within a, a value framework, not sort of the radical transformation that you're looking at, looking for. So I would say one of the, 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 the th real themes, I think the challenges for us are in, in relation to ICT and development and exclusion are looking at um, what are regarded as um, good practice, and I use that instead of best practice, um, uh, processes and institutional makeups and frameworks um, in mature economies, mature political systems that are essentially looking for um, uh, reform within an accepted value system, within a accepted um, institutional framework, etc. They're not looking for revolutionary change. And I think that is the difference between um, you know, exploring issues of development and understanding the, core, the needs for development um, and the causes of inequality, um, is that we're looking for um, you know, transformational change um, in our societies that requires that we do things in different ways. And I'm, you know, as I said, I'm not sh um, sure always what that is. Um, so really, I was looking at the issue of this at the global governance level, mainly because I was trying to um, <clears throat> uh, sort of extract us from what for me has been a very moribund um, development debate for the last 20 years. I've been very specifically, I mean, at ICTD and all of these things, I'm very clear that I'm not a development theorist. I don't buy it. I don't like, it doesn't work for me. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I'm trying to review that. I'm trying to go back and say, actually, you know, it is actually development we're concerned with, and I do have to engage with this. But I think the kind of polarization that we've seen between, you know, state and market, citizens and consumers, um, these are all very um, outmoded uh, views of a far more complex, fluid, um, globalized world that we need to make sense of. Um, and so um, what I've tried to do in, we, we try to do in our own work is constantly look at um, policy, because that is where our concern is, in terms of the evidence that is available. And I think that's what I've, I sort of find most frustrating about um, NGO and um, a, um, um, civil society efforts um, and initiatives within national government and global governance arrangements, having sort of had the hard reality check of being in government and trying to make things happen, um, is that, you know, you can actually present evidence 
And if it doesn't fit comfortably, ideologically comfortably, with where you know the, the movement's coming from, it's it's simply rejected or it's spoken out. You know, so um, again, so it's this 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 notion of you know. Um, uh, just to give you a practical example, you know, so you, you reject something simply b by labelling it neoliberal. Well, well, what does that mean? You know, what about neoliberalism are we concerned with? And I think there has been literature that actually identifies some of the problems with it. Um, but it's not black and white and it's not even. So if you take, for example, um, issues of purely access, um, I, I, you know, uh, basically the, 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 the liberal... Um, uh, the ref uh, market reform project is what has liberated communications in Africa. Um, the opening up of markets, the competitive opening up of markets, um, has achieved more in terms of allowing people access to communication um, in a decade or two than was achieved in the previous hundred years, previous century. So um, state provisioning, public utility provisioning um, of the kind that is you know, admired and respected historically um, in the North, simply can't be um, uh, used as a measure or as an alternative in, in the South. We have to look at what, you know, what state institutions are there, how fragile are our states, and what is their capacity to um, effectively direct markets. So on the one hand, if you look at purely by opening up the markets, the markets actually have achieved a whole lot for more for poor people than I should add, you know, universal service strategies and telecenters and a whole lot of other things, well-intentioned as they may be. Um, that's not to say that there isn't market failure. That's not to say that there's highly inequitable use of that access. Um, and that is precisely what, you know, state capacity is required and, and you need to build it. But you need to look at it. You need to say, well, what can the state do? And I know there are groups and certainly we have partners in, in Asia who, you know, every time um, I raise the need to capacitate the state and I think in line with a lot of the um, post-Washington consensus um, critique and acknowledgement by some of the engineers of the post-Washington consensus themselves that, um, uh, or, or the, of, the, of the Washington consensus that, you know, the uh, reductionism of the state, the reduction of the state, um, uh, the stripping down of the state actually made it, you know, ineffective for the a project of reform. It's it, the very project of reform. So, um, as I said, I know there are groups that say, you know, ba basically we have failed states um, across Africa and several parts of Asia. We have, um, you know, significantly, significantly large numbers of failed states. And basically, um, these are a, um, a, a drag on the market. They're a drag on the opening up of, 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 of markets. And I think, uh, you know, um, I, I can understand where the skepticism comes from. But I think, um, you know, once the markets have created this access and openness, if you actually begin to look at issues of inequality beyond that, issues of, you know, demand, um, of, of, of demand stimulation, of access, of equality, um, the markets only open up the access. The ability to um, uh, use those services equitably, the ability to um, use them, to use the potential of it, is really dependent on a whole lot of things that require either state regulation of markets to sh ensure that prices are, are fair and competitive, for the state to act as a proxy for competition in infrastructure industries when it's often difficult to build um, infrastructure competition um, to get positive um, outcomes, and of course far more fundamentally as we move into um, the internet era and the complexities of, um, of, 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 of digital communication, the, the most fundamental issues of um, human um, uh, capacity. And, and that goes to the issues of capabilities that we've spoken about. So um, I've really only touched on, on one um, issue here, um, and I've, the whole machine sh shut down because I spoke so long. Um, so I just, I, I've, I've, I've identified in this um, paper a number of issues that I thought we could um, kind of return to and also explore that um, could form part of a, a, a sort of new conceptual framework for um, a debate and a discussion on, on development theory. So I, d I did start by looking very quickly at the issue. Um, basically, if I'm looking at um, global governance, 
Um, my concern with that has been the, the uh, marginalization of African countries and African citizens from the processes of, of not only of participation in that system, which we've had identified and the great maps that um, Mark and Chris have produced, um, highlight that. Although I should just add quickly, because I know I won't get a chance to speak about it, but I think one of our major challenges, um, besides the poverty of theory in the field, is the poverty of data. And I think that the kind of data we have is extremely inadequate. We all know that. We all desperately you know, searching for funding. But our um, effort over the last uh, 10 years as Research ICT Africa is precisely just to build the evidence base for informed policy, that, to build the empirical evidence. And I think that's what we constantly have to do as we look at strategies, as we look at policies, as we look at um, theory, is to go back and say, well, what does the evidence tell us about that? We might like the way it sounds, and it might you know, fit in ideologically, but actually the evidence is not supporting um, the strategies and things we want to adopt. So for me, then, the, the research question, um, my, the, the purpose of this research was really to explore the tensions of um, these relationships um, between sort of developing countries to have their needs net, met at the international fora and global governance systems, um, and the potential of engagement in these forums to support democratic, political, and economic institutional transformation at the national and regional level. So instead of this kind of polarization that we find ourselves in often, and I think over the last few days, where, um, you know, uh, African states are seen as fragile, dysfunctional, um, and you know, tr to be avoided, to be worked around. We try and find um, ways of building that capacity and getting commitments to um, to uh, development, um, getting commitments to by governments to sorry, getting gov uh, commitments from from governments to. Um, to, to human rights frameworks and things, you know, UN ex accepted um, practices. So the issues that I thought one really needs to look at is this tension between global and national. Um, the issues around um, the dangers of the digital divide discourse without um, looking beyond the access issues, without looking at um, the issues of, of, of equality. Um, I'll just flag these now. I just thought we needed to spend some more time on conceptualizing um, inclusion. I think there's been a lot of literature on this, and I think all of us who've spoken um, have, con we, you know, we, we, we conceptualize um, inclusion by the counterfactual. We um, only understand inclusion by the examination of exclusion, and we haven't really um, got strong strategies of inclusion. Um, we've, uh, you know, we, we, it, it's defined by exclusion rather than by strategies of inclusion. As I said, I think the, the, the state and market to present this as something that's polarized is um, just sort of historically incorrect. Um, the whole, um, you know, if one looks at modernity, this is a, a tension and a relationship and a struggle in certain circumstances between the state and the market. That the market is, if we accept that we are in a, you know, a capitalist and now a late capitalized, globalized economy, um, this is the um, process of exchange of information and transactions and ideas, etc. And the only um, and, and the state has constantly tried to mold that either in its short or long term interests. And so um, we need to uh, see how we can co um, co uh, constrain global markets which are not bound by, na by nation states um, in the global governance systems, how the market inequalities can be, can be addressed. Um, and then just, I'll just flag a few others because we don't, I don't have any more time. But um, essentially, I, I, and again, I think the, uh, the polarization of citizen and consumer is within that discussion and within that paradigm that we are both consumers and citizens and we can, by gaining access um, to global networks, etc., we can exercise certain influence, and we see this in the Arab Spring and the failures of the Arab Spring, of course, and the use of these ICTs for repressive um, purposes as well. But um, essentially, I think we need to, even if we don't accept uncritically a kind of post-Washington consensus, there are a number of um, things that we can do that um, will, f will provide us with pillars around building a development a theory and a development strategy. And I think these relate to um, trying to build e efficient um, uh, 
functioning states that we have to put our energies into that and as I said just quickly on that to just just say while we have to build you know stronger states and there has been a, a backlash to these ineffective and fragile states we also need to consider what the real possibilities and capacity is there so you know we cannot with these very fragile states emulate developmental states of East Asia um, with much stronger democratic traditions. We cannot emulate authoritarian developmental states of East Asia. They, these are not going to fit. So the issues, the issue of institutional endowments and the fit and the align and what is possible there needs to really be understood on a on a case by case and a, and a regional basis. So one is efficient um, states. The other one is to leverage the potential, the innovation, and the value of the market in the public interest for a, you know, a, a, a bigger issue, a, a go, a, a, the common good, the public good, et cetera, as each case um, pertains. So one should look at the, the market as an instrument, which it is. It's an instrument of the state. It's an instrument um, of, of citizenry. Citizenry in the democratic process determine the regulation that they want of the state. Um, so I'll have to leave that there. Thank Thanks, you. Alison.